Definitely, this is something you don't have in America. Um, not anything is old. Probably a copy of it somewhere in Las Vegas, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Made out of plaster. Okay, I have the big pleasure to interview my dear friend Roman. Roman is probably the most successful Eastern European tech entrepreneur. And he started three companies. And three companies always uh, when it comes to interesting times. So his first company, no, uh, NetBeans has yeah. been the first one. The second one was Sistinet. Sistinet. And he, he started this company just right after September 11th. It was Sistinet, exactly. And uh, his latest startup, uh, Good Data, he just started financing on the day Lehman crashed. When you see me raising money, run. You know, <laughs> something bad will happen. So that's always the case. So you moved to Silicon Valley. Is this still the best place for entrepreneurs? I, I believe it is. And I actually believe that it's getting better. And it, it always will be the best place for entrepreneurs. You know, uh, Silicon Valley is heads and shoulders over places like Boston or, or, or Austin. And it's, it's, uh, it's the best place in the world for many reasons that we can talk about. But at the same time, I, I, by now, I also believe that San Francisco is better than Silicon Valley. So there is a real competition for Silicon Valley. So rest of the world, even the rest of America? <laughs> absolutely, is... absolutely. So is there anything from Europe which inspires you as an entrepreneur? Is there any good people in Europe? Yes, actually my role model is European uh, and it's uh, Christopher Columbus. Think about it, you know, he was the first VC uh, funded guy. He raised money from his VCs from the Spanish Queen. Uh, he uh, raised money for something that nobody believed in. He took a major risk. Uh, his first voyage of Col Christopher Columbus was about 70 people, three boats, 70 people. So they, pro they would probably qualify for a Y Combinator or something like okay, that. Or, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and, and then, you know, like two months into the, into the voyage, you know, they lost the wind and he almost got killed by, um, by his crew. So talk about, you know, taking risks. And, uh, and then he asked for one more day and that was the day they saw Bahamas, but there was no, no way to go back. So that's an example of somebody who really is an entrepreneur who was financed and who was very much European. So, speaking about America and Europe, probably one of the big advantages you have in America is scaling. So, maybe you give us some ideas of how you see scaling opportunities in America. I see, I see scaling on, on multiple levels. So, so financing-wise, uh, look at good data. We've raised so far uh, $55 million. We will probably need to raise another $100 million from uh, uh, public and private markets. So that's, that's, amount of, that's a big chunk of money that would be probably very difficult to raise in, in Europe. Uh, scaling in terms of non, you know, qualified people who are ready to work for you. So, so you, when, you, when you build a company that hires you know, thousands of, of well-qualified people, you have to be in a place where these people are available, they are ready to move, they are ready to kind of work for you. And, and that's, that's, that's in Silicon Valley but also scale in terms of customers. I, my biggest surprise when I move, moved to the US for the first time, how open and willing the customers in US are to really take uh, small companies seriously and, 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 and essentially work with us and help us to be successful. Is there a difference between consumer scaling and enterprise scaling? Uh, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. For, for consumer scaling, you, you essentially, you know, you, you need, you need extremely good idea, you need to have extremely good timing and you need to have, uh, you know, investors or, or money that doesn't really pause for a second. Anybody who says, well, wait a minute, we will look at it and we will think about it and give us two more weeks and so on. In consumer business, winner takes all. Uh, YouTube was number one. I don't know who number two was, probably Vimeo. And nobody remembers number three to number 50. Nobody remembers them. And that's the difference in, in the consumer. It's, it's like a casino. 
number one wins all, number two gets you know, 10%, and everybody else gets zero. So anybody who slows you down, VCs, lawyers, employees, customers, anybody who slows you down makes you, makes you a loser. So your advice would be that if you want to be successful in consumer play or even enterprise play, move over to the US. No, not necessarily. Not, maybe, maybe for enterprise. Um, I, I usually tell, that, tell people that it takes me less time to get in front of CIO of Merrill Lynch globally than it takes me to get in front of CIO of a commercial banker in Prague. And, uh, That's and, disappointing. <laughs> I know, I know, but, but there, there is a reason, you know, and the reason why U.S. customers are willing to take money from or, or take products and pay money to, from a small company is that stakes are much higher. You know, for example, every single major U.S. banks take many of their IT people once a year, they open a tent in Silicon Valley, and they invite all of the startups to go to pitch them. So I go four times a year to meet you know, Bank of America and JP Morgan Chase and Citibank and so on, and I don't need to fly to New York. They actually come to me. They actually open a hotel and they invite us for dinners and so on because they want to buy from small companies. And, and so, so the scaling and, and so on, it takes, it takes ecosystem like that. So f probably for, for the enterprise system, you, you need to, you need to uh, you know, enterprise companies, you need to move to US. But for consumer, I believe that you know, Berlin and, and London and maybe a few other places are good enough to start a successful uh, consumer company. So there's hope. Absolutely. So if you imagine like a three-person team in Europe, like what should, what should they tap into? Which market do you see right open now for them? So, so, so what I see open is, you know, I, people call it big data. I don't, I don't call it big data. I actually call it uh, big data, small screens. That's my definition of the market. It's, it's every time a piece of computing moves to the cloud, it actually moves from PC, and, and, the, and the, the device, the, the, cons, you know, the way it's actually consumed is, is the small screen. So anybody who comes with an idea how to leverage big data and how to actually get it on a small screen can win big, even though they are based in, in Berlin, London, or Prague, or wherever. So would you then encourage people just go mobile, or is mobile, do you have to do web and mobile at the same time? I don't think it's, it's I, 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 I don't believe that, you know, there is anything else than mobile. It's, it's web is mobile, everything is mobile. It's actually, you know, HTML5 is probably better for web than, you know, for, for you know, these devices. So these days I would, only, I would only build a mobile startup, nothing else. One of your big mantras is actually fail fast. Maybe you can talk about this a bit. Yeah, abso absolutely. So, so, so here's the deal. You know, small company startup is not a smaller version of IBM. You know, even though we have sales and marketing and product development, we are not IBM. The main goal of a small company is to try, learn, fail, validate, and, and fail better. And, and so that's the only way we can win over the big guys is by learning every single day. So startups are learning organizations, and the only way you can learn, like our kids, is by failing. There's no other way. <laughs> so what could entrepreneurs learn from you like when you started your companies? So as you mentioned, my timing is always bad. I believe in, in, uh, in extreme anti-cyclical timing. I believe that the worst time to start a company is when you have a room full of you know, thousands of people who want to start companies. When I started you know, all of my startups, there was no such thing as you know, uh, VC money or, or anything like that. You know, I, again, I, I, when, I, when I came to Boston to raise money for a system at, um, it, was, it was the first flight after September 11th. And uh, I was like, well, why, why do I even come here? Why do I even want to do this? Nobody will fund me. Nobody will fund a, a company, startups, two weeks after September 11th. By, by Christmas time, we had $21 million term sheet. So it was October, November. It took us two months to raise $21 million in 2001. 
was the background that you're not American uh, an issue at any no, time? No, no. <laughs> yes, and here's another funny story. So at Cystinet, half of our sales was to Department of Defense. Think about it. I moved to U.S. two weeks after September 11th. <laughs> uh, we raised money, you know, in Boston, and six months into it, we get first order from Department of Defense. And then, you know, over the year, uh, U.S. government, or actually, you know, U.S. military became my f number one customer. 50% of my revenue was actually coming from them. And the fact that I was not a U.S. citizen became actually a big problem, and I had to hire, hire a professional U.S.-born CEO to run the company because it was my business. But still, the fact that they bought from us, that was amazing. So you have been three times spot on on the right future trend. Um, what are the first things you do? Why, or how can you be actually sure that these companies are all be successful? So or what makes success for you? <laughs> So it goes to, it goes to you know, Christopher Columbus. He was successful because he actually miscalculated the risk. He believed that, you know, he believed that Asia is three times closer than actually it is. And he was lucky there was America in the middle. Otherwise, he would have died. So, so my risk, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, NetBeans, we started NetBeans when, um, when Java was two months old. And I said, well, Java will need another tool, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat IBM and Symantec and Borland. And everybody said, you absolutely crazy. Absolutely, there was no single person in the world who believed that I can be ever successful with NetBeans. Uh, we, we built NetBeans. We decided, you know, uh, we had our methodology how to get innovation into companies. We decided you know, to build it. We had five people in Prague. 18 months later, when we had 100,000 downloads, I got a call from Sun Microsystems, and they said, we want to buy you. And, and 100,000 downloads in 98, you have to understand, people couldn't possibly Google us, because there was no Google. Uh, so to, have, to get to 100,000 downloads then was actually, you know, it's like a billion today. A billion today. You, you spoke about your methodology. So what is it? I, I, I don't know. It's my job. That's what I do. You know, my, my job is to see trends. You know, uh, with Cystinet, we saw the web services 18 months before everybody kind of anybody noticed. And with good data, even the fact that it's called good data, and we started in 2007, and the term big data was not coined until you know 2009, tells you that you know that's that's what that's what I do. So with good data, it's actually um, big business optimization or monetization. Monetization, absolutely. So maybe you tell us a bit about what good data actually is and which kind of companies could use it. Uh, so, so uh, you know, these days, if you, look at, if you look at, you know, anything that we do, anything that we do, it is now being op automated. You know, 10 years ago, I was working with some, you know, uh, you know, notepad, and I was making notes. Today, everything I do, everything what my salespeople, my marketing people, my support people, my developers do, gets captured and automated. Every single interaction, every single tweet with customer, you know, it used to be a phone call, now it's tweet. It used to be email, now it goes to salesforce.com. It used to be a, a snail mail marketing blast, now it's, you know, uh, exact target. Everything is now measurable, and I absolutely believe that Companies will need more and more tools to measure their data, to capture, organize, store, visualize, and measure their data. And that's what we do at Good Data. We want to dis uh, disrupt $100 billion market. So a small startup could use Good Data? Uh, probably not today. Uh, our sweet spot today are big companies. I have, to, I have to build some muscle. I have to you know, gain some revenue, build some product. And it's usually easier when you are small to sell to slightly larger companies because they have more patience, they, they have people in consulting, they can spend real money. The product doesn't necessarily need to be fully fleshed out, but we will get there. We will, you know, at some point probably in a year, we will be able to sell to anybody. Um, you know, we sell at this moment, you know, my annual price for good data is somewhere between 100 to $100,000 to a half a million. So 
by with this success you're building with good data, you're tapping into a market where IBM, SAP, Oracle is working in right now. Uh, how do you want to crush them? So, so we usually say that in enterprise, it takes five years to be overnight success. Think about it. You know, you cannot you cannot just show up and say, well, I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to kill IBM and so on. So, so. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in innovator's dilemma, and I believe that's, that's the book that everybody in this room should buy and, and, and study and read. And many people read that book, and many people come up with different interpretation. And here is my inter inter interpretation. So, so when you want to be successful and get an innovation into any company, you cannot go into a front door. There's no way a, a big bank or, or you know, a big company like GE will ever buy a, from a small company. You have, to, you have to do it you know, differently. And the way we always did it with my companies is that you find a secondary market. You find a market that's so bad, has so bad economics, so low margins, that's so, so, so bad that nobody wants to be there. So you essentially have no competition because everybody says, well, why would I be in a market where it's so scrappy and so difficult to make money? You, use that market to build your technology, to hire your people, to develop customers, and at the time when you have thousands of customers, when you have good technology, and when you actually know how to operate in a low margin market, then you can go to the high margin market and compete against, against uh, Oracle and IBM and, 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 and uh, anybody else, but because you are trained in low margin market, your economics are so much better that you can go to any CIO and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same as Oracle. I'm 100 times cheaper. I'm 100 times faster. And I have 10,000 customers because I was already operating for five years in secondary market. So you become invincible. So is the CEO, is it you who is doing the big sales? Or how do you organize sales and get good data? So, so he, he, here is another example, kind of Christopher Columbus moment of Roman Stanek. So about 18 months ago, I had to make the biggest decision that you know, a CEO has to make, and, and that was hire my VP of sales. And that's kind of zero, mar zero margin for error decision. You cannot make any mistake. If you hire the wrong guy, the wrong guy hires the wrong sales team. They spend a million dollars and nine months to come to the conclusion that it doesn't work. And then the board fires the VP of sales, and the new CEO hires the new VP of sales. So, so there was no margin for error. And that's, that's an example where you have 50 guys you look at, and you say, well, if I pick any one of them, 40, 49, I will be out of job. My company will get diluted. We will probably have down route. And maybe one of them is good. And that's the one you have to find. And that's, that's again, that's a decision that a CEO has to make. You have to be able to prove it to the board. You have to be able to, to put nine months and millions of dollars behind a sales team and hope it's going to work. There's no other way. So you found the person. Maybe you tell us a bit, like, hands-on tricks, how to find the right people. So, so I. So we obviously, you know, at, at Good Data, we are hiring lots of people. We, have, uh, we are using, I have to do a little plug here. So, so I'm an investor in a small company called uh, Smart Recruiters. And uh, we use Smart Recruiters to organize our hiring process. Uh, we have about 400 people at any given time in hiring process. So that we, have, we are registering 400 people that are at different stage of interviewing, um, you know, uh, coming to the company, presenting to us, and so on. So it's, it's a large... So it's 400 people 400 that you people. have now? One, how many? 150, 200? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you think about it, out of, out of 10 people, you hire one. So for 100 people, you have to see 1,000. And, and so it's a big tunnel, a funnel. It takes, me, it takes me and my people, it takes us probably 50% of our time. We have four inside recruiters, people who actually are calling on people, getting people in front of us, organizing. We have a full-time uh, recruiting coordinator, somebody who puts recruiting you know, on our agendas, who uh, is scheduling meetings and making sure that people go through the process and so on. Is it still you who's interviewing at, uh, at the very last moment? I'm, I'm, I'm meeting 
probably at the very last moment I'm meeting most of the people, if not all of the people, I make decision about every single hire we make. So I get you know the, all of the support papers and so on in front of me. So what would you say is the biggest task for CEOs? The, bi the biggest task for CEO is confidence. That's the name of the game. If you ask me what's the name of the game of startups, it's all about confidence. If you don't give your, if you don't give your investors confidence that you will be successful, you will not be able to raise money. You will not be able to get valuation that will get you where you need to be. If you don't have confidence, you will not be able to hire the best people, and the best people will go to your competition. If you don't have a confidence to walk to the office of a CIO of a major bank and say, I want half a million dollars for my product, and that's the deal, and then you don't, you don't get it. It's, 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 it's chief, chief CEO, um, ben, ben Horowitz, has a beautiful, the best blog post from Ben Horowitz is called uh, Wartime and Peacetime CEO. Everybody should go and, 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 and blog it, and you will see what it actually takes to be a CEO of a startup. It's, it's essentially, again, giving people the confidence that this is going to be the most successful company in the world, that we will win, and nobody, nobody needs to worry. Investors don't need to worry. Even though internally, you know, you always worry. There's always something happening that makes you wonder what, what's, what's going to happen next and so on. But it, cannot, it can never you know, be visible to anybody because that's the role of the CEO to kind of lead the people. Let's speak about venture capital. So how did you raise, right after September 11th, the money for good data? Tell us a bit about your was, stories. After September 11th was oh, 16 uh, uh, yeah. uh, but Lehman Brothers. Brothers. No, it was extremely hard. You know, one of the things that people don't realize when people look at exits, how, how impossibly hard it is to build a company. It's, I, I, look at, you know, I look at my calendar on the way here, I usually work 80 plus hours a week for the last five, five years. I spend, you know, when I raise money, I'm spending, you know, hours and hours and hours in front of VCs. Uh, in 2009, when we were raising money for good data, it was impossible to raise money. It was absolutely impossible, not because VCs didn't want to fund us. They actually did not know if they have the money. For somebody who had money stuck in Lehman Brothers, you know, bank account, what do you do when Lehman Brothers goes out of business? So we did, we started money raising on, on September 15, 2008. It was the day Lehman Brothers failed. I, I landed in New York, I opened newspaper, and uh, excuse my French, I said, oh, fuck. <laughs> and, uh, and then it took us nine months to actually raise money. It was extremely painful. And when we raised money in Boston from General Catalyst, it was the first funding they did in, in six months or nine months. They stopped funding whatsoever. And, and the reason why they stopped funding was that they, when you have money allocated for, let's say, five startups, and you assume that half of the money will come from um, uh, syndication, and then you realize that nobody will syndicate with you, so you essentially have money for half of your portfolio. So instead of, instead of you know, funding new companies, you, ha you essentially have to eliminate, eliminate half of your portfolio because that's, that's, that's how much money you have. So in 2009, most VCs were eliminating their portfolios and not raising money. But, but again, I usually tell people that tough times breed tough companies. That's the best time to raise money because you have, it's, it's extremely difficult, it's extremely painful, but very few companies get funded. You have no real competition. It's easy to get attention because you are the only one who raised money, and, and that's, that's the way to do it. So how did the follow-on funding go? So, so the, the A round was, again, it was very painful, incredibly painful. Uh, the B round we did with Andreessen Horowitz, it was $15 million. It was, it was much, much easier. And by now, you know, we raised our C round uh, about uh, six or eight weeks ago. And it took us from the first call with the leading VC to money in a bank less than 10 days. I repeat it, from first call, introductory call with the VC to $25 million in a bank in less than 10 days. Wow. Including all of the documentation, all of the paperwork, term sheet, 
documentation, everything, money wired, stock issued. This is a completely different time uh, than in, in Europe. So what is your trick in, in, in getting amazing valuations, the world-class VCs on board? So what, what is your advice for, for us? It's, at the end of the day, it's the combination of the best team. You have to have the best team. You, essentially, you have to have you know team that can walk in from the VC and they say, well, this is, this is, this is, these are the winners. You have to have a large enough addressable market. If you go after a small market with small tool, you know, is no point. And in case of good data, we have something, something very new even for me. We actually have a sustainable platform. NetBeans was never a sustainable platform. It was always a, a uh, there was always understanding that we would at some point sell NetBeans. That no no tools company can be a you know self sufficient company. It was always a question who will buy NetBeans. With Systemnet, it was the same. It was like well we, we built a point tool, and the question was who will actually buy you know who would buy uh, Systemnet? Is it going to be Oracle? Is it going to be HP or Sun at that moment? It was at the end of the day it was HP. With good data, I can buy companies. I can go and buy companies. I can build independent company that will actually dominate the world. And that's what, that's what I essentially justify the valuations and timing and people and everything. So revolutionizing the world of big data? Uh, by, uh, essentially, if you, look at, if you look at, let me spend a couple of minutes on, on good data differentiation. If you look at anything data management today, any company in this room, anybody who wants to deal with data, has to buy a lot of stuff. Data analytics or data, big data, is not a product. It's a value chain. You have to buy data transformation. You have to buy Hadoop. You have to buy hardware. You have to buy visualization, analytics, dashboarding. You have to buy lots of stuff. And, and that's, you know, buying a lot of stuff worked when you analyze static data. Ten years ago, when your general ledger didn't change, it was okay if it took you 18 months to build a big data or da any data project. Today, if you want to add a new field in your campaign and you want to analyze that campaign the same day, you cannot go to 15 products and change the schemas and everything and so on. And that's the main premise of good data is that we, we are essentially turning what used to be a very expensive value chain that took 18 months and a lot of risk. And we are turning it into easy to buy, easy to understand business service that essentially eliminates all the risk. So this time, no selling to big companies going IPO? Uh, there's no, 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 I don't know. It's like, well, the companies are bought, not sold. That's one thing that everybody should, you know, start company with. Every time you want to sell a company, you will get 10% of the value of the company. Companies get bought. You know, somebody has to come to you. I, I, usually, I usually tell even my people at Good Data, um, there are two ingredients when, when company has good exit valuation. It's lust and fear. It's lust and fear. If you don't have lust, I want to own it. This is, this is, this is what I need to own then you don't get a good valuation. And if you don't, and at the same time, having fear, if I don't buy this company, and this company goes to my competitor, or this company will disrupt me, or I will get you know, disrupted, unless you have these two things, you cannot, force, you cannot force exit. You cannot have an exit strategy that you go to, you will hire a banker, and they will create that last and fear for you. That has to come from, you know, from the buyer. And so there is no point to have any sort of exit strategy, because at the end of the day, you have to work hard. You have to really kind of, you know, be successful, and the rest will come. So I don't know if somebody will come to us and, and make an offer that it will be difficult to, to say no to. But uh, IPO to me looks like an obvious, obvious exit for, you know, obvious future for good data. So speaking about so much success, let's flip the tables and get from you some information about, like, where have been the, the tough times? So when was it difficult? When did you struggle? I, 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 I struggle every time. Every time, like, you know, I know every single crappy hotel or motel between San Jose and, and San Francisco. 
I know the back of the every single jumbo that flies from London to San Francisco. You know, the last row used to be my row. Um, I, I did get more no's from VCs than anybody in this room, or probably all combined. It's actually, you know, th funny thing about VCs, you know, when we spoke about VCs, they never tell you no. Did you know that? There's no no from VCs? Do you, do you, do you say no to your, to your potential investments? I do. Good. Most VCs maybe don't. I'm European. I know, I know. No, no, no. Most VCs never say no. It's called, it's, it's a famous VC no when they stop talking to you. That's how you know they are not interested. So how do I know that they're interested in me, the US ones? No, only, so, so here's the story. So, so my, my office is in downtown San Francisco. It takes about an hour of drive from Sand Hill Road, where all of the VCs are, to downtown San Francisco. And many times I get calls from you know, European entrepreneurs who come to pitch US VCs. And they come and ask me for coffee and, and share ideas and so on. And they usually, they usually come to, to my office for coffee after they spend time in, at Sand Hill Road. And I always ask them one, you know, and they ask them, how is it going? And they say, it went really well. I went to visit Kleiner and, and this and this company, Sequoia. And they are on, interested and they want to talk to us, you know, more. And they want to find out, find out more. And I always ask them the same question. Have they called you back since then, since you visited them? And they say, well, no, I was there only an hour ago. You don't get it. I just came from there. And I say, you don't get it. That's what I mean. If they were really interested, they would have called you in the meantime. They would probably not let you to get, get, you know, leave their office without a term sheet. So in the US, the bad sign, if you don't get a call back in the next hour, on the, you know, at least the same day, you will not get funded from those VCs. And uh, because there's not enough, you know, last and fear. Um, but going back, going back to the VC, no. Um, in most cases, essentially, you don't hear from them. Or if you hear from them, you hear because they are looking at your competitor and they want to do some evaluation. And the most, the most dangerous thing from VCs is called uh, technical due diligence. I always refuse to do any technical due diligence because always they always send some no speaking you know technical guy who has no idea what we do who is trying to find some problems that's usually a sign that they are not interested they are only looking for excuses so if they raise the term technical due diligence just say no I say no I say no yeah if you don't you know how can anybody who spends an hour with me get an idea of what I did for the last two years how is that even possible? Somebody who's new to that market, who never spoke to a customer, who never really understands, you know, somebody who would be able to do it should be an entrepreneur and build my competitor. So I, I, I say no. So since, well, thankfully, you're very busy with good data, doing it bigger and bigger, taking maybe to, to IPO. So which are markets you see we should capture? What do you mean? What, what, like? what kind of markets you see fragmented, as you said, like looking at markets where there's uh, zero competition? Do, do you see industries or certain areas where uh, we in the meantime could I, do something? You know, so for example, you know, in, in, uh, I will give you an example. You know, I spoke about you know, being first in, in non-obvious markets. So in both case of Systinet and Good Data, we actually started as OEM supplier. You know, we actually use somebody else's brand to get out. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a market that's, you know, a, 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 a vertical or, or territory. It can be actually obvious market, but you, you go and, and you know, you, you OEM. You don't, you know, you don't start with your own brand. So if you, if you, if you use, if you use some, some leading SaaS companies like Zendesk, Zendesk is using good data for their analytics. That's an example of the market where I, I essentially have 3,000 customers who use us as users of Zendesk. And, and we only sold once, we sold to Zendesk, and they are selling good data to their customers. So that's an example of, you know, if you, if you want to be successful, you always have to look at how does the ecosystem, a value chain is shaped up, shaped up and what can I do to, uh, to be able to actually leverage that value chain? It doesn't necessarily need to be a new market. Excellent. Our time is uh, running up. Uh, I would like to 
and say thank you, Roman, for this very interesting talk. Well done. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks.